This video is brought to you by World of Warships. Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and today I am at the Royal Canadian Artillery Museum in Shiloh, Manitoba, having a look at a deceptively simple yet surprisingly long-lived and effective piece of military communications gear. This is a Mance-style heliograph. And devices like these were used for over a hundred years by various militaries as well as civilian organizations like forestry services to communicate at long distances using flashes of sunlight. But before we get into the fascinating history of the heliograph, first a word from the sponsor of this video, World of Warships. World of Warships is a free-to-play online game that lets you take command of some of history's most iconic warships. Choose from over 600 battleships, cruisers, destroyers, aircraft carriers, and submarines, from the legendary Yamato, Tirpitz, Iowa, and Dreadnought, to the more obscure Rio de Janeiro, Viribus Unitas, and Mogador. Each ship is lovingly recreated down to the last detail, with key stats like top speed, turning radius, armor protection, and the time needed to aim and reload the guns accurately represented. Battle against a massive online community in more than 40 highly detailed maps with stunning water and weather effects that put you right in the heart of the action. With each victory, you unlock ever more powerful ships, allowing you to dominate the high seas. And with new content released every month, including in-game nations, ship classes, or themed maps like Transformers, Popeye, or Godzilla vs. Kong, there's always something exciting to look forward to. From November 16th to 30th, players can participate in a special in-game collaboration event between World of Warships and the popular anime High School Fleet. At registration, use the promo code HSF2023 to receive a huge starter pack including 200 doubloons, 1 million credits, 7 days of premium account time, and 2 high school fleet commanders. Link in the description. Oh, and did I mention World of Warships is also available on console? Now, I don't normally play a lot of video games, but even I have to say World of Warships is a ton of fun, and I love the sheer variety of historical warships that you get to play. So, what are you waiting for? Like Nelson, I expect that every viewer will do their duty. Now, as I mentioned in my previous video on the Aldous signal lamp, although long-range optical communication has been around since antiquity in the form of signal fire, smoke signals, flag signals, and the like, the systematic use of flashing lights, whether artificial or sunlight, to send long-distant messages is a surprisingly recent development. Now, you might have heard stories of, say, a Greek hoplite at the Battle of Marathon sending a signal by flashing sunlight off his shield, but such accounts are highly disputed by historians. As far as we know, strangely enough, for most of human history up until the mid-19th century, nobody really thought to use mirrors to send signals. So the immediate ancestor of the heliograph was something called the heliotrope, which was invented in 1821 by none other than famous German mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss. And this wasn't so much a communications instrument as it was a surveying instrument. And the idea was that you would use the heliotrope to track and reflect sunlight to create a very bright reference point, say on a mountaintop, that a surveyor could very easily sight through their theodolite. And from Germany, the use of the heliotrope spread across the world, and it was introduced into British service by George Everest, who made widespread use of it in his 1831 geodetic survey of India. And if that name sounds familiar, yes, this is the same person that Mount Everest is named after. Now, around 30 years later, there would be another British pioneer stationed in India by the name of Henry Mance. He was an electrical engineer. He helped lay the first telegraph cable across the Persian Gulf. And in 1869, he was stationed in Karachi in what is now Pakistan. And in this year, he came up with the heliograph, which was a tilting parabolic mirror mounted on a tripod, which could be used to send signals of flashing sunlight long distances. And he thought that this would be excellent for military communications and tried to interest the British government into officially adopting it. Unfortunately, the government showed very little interest in his invention, so of his own initiative, he built a couple of examples and sent them to Lord Roberts, who was then fighting in Afghanistan. And Lord Roberts tried them out and found that they were extremely effective, especially in mountainous terrain, such as you find in Afghanistan. And on his recommendation, the British Army conducted formal field trials out to 56 kilometers with excellent results. And in 1877, the heliograph was officially adopted as standard equipment. 
and its first official use in combat would come in that same year during the Joachia Friedi punitive expedition to the northwest frontier of India. And the success of the heliograph in that campaign soon came to the attention of Albert Meyer, the founder of the American Signal Service, later the American Signal Corps. And he managed to convince the British government to send them basically every heliograph they had in their inventory. And he sent these off to Colonel Nelson Miles, who at the time was engaged in the Apache campaign of the Indian Wars in the southwestern United States. And Colonel Miles immediately saw how the heliograph could be used to rob the Apache of their primary advantages, which were speed and stealth. The Apache were able to cover lots of ground very quickly unseen, allowing them to mount very effective surprise raids against U.S. government positions. So what Miles did was to establish a chain of six heliographs across 220 kilometers between Fort Cow and Fort Custer, basically creating a giant net through which the Apache were unable to pass unseen. So once they were spotted, their position and direction of movement would be rapidly relayed to the nearest fort, and they would be ready for the attack. And this proved highly effective. And indeed, 10 years later, Miles would use the same technique in the hunt for Geronimo, establishing an even larger network of 27 heliograph stations across New Mexico and Arizona. And the heliograph is credited as one of the key elements in the success of both these campaigns. Now, from this point forward, heliographs would be used all over the world. The British used them during the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879, and they were used by both sides during the Second Boer War of 1899 to 1902. And they proved especially effective in cases where British garrisons found themselves besieged by the Boers, such as Mafeking, Kimberley, and Ladysmith. The Boers would cut the telegraph lines going in and out of these towns, and so the only way of getting information in and out was via heliograph during the day and signal lamps such as the oil-fired Begbie lamp at night. They were also used during the Spanish-American War, and the German Imperial Schutztruppe made extensive use of heliographs during their campaign of extermination against the Herero and Nama people of German Southwest Africa, today Namibia. And on the civilian side of things, in 1909, the U.S. Forestry Service adopted heliographs for communicating between ranger stations. And again, they proved very effective at this, and the heliograph is, along with the telephone, credited as being one of the key innovations that allowed the creation of a successful forestry service, both in the United States and Canada. Now, during the First World War, heliographs weren't used all that much on the Western Front for reasons of climate, as well as the ready availability of telegraphs and telephones, though powered signal lamps like the German Blinkgerät were used in cases where telephone or telegraph lines were cut. However, heliographs were used extensively in Mesopotamia, where the climate and the terrain were ideal for this form of communication. Now, the Soviet Red Army would use heliographs during their expeditions into Turkestan in the 1920s, and heliographs were still being used well into the Second World War, particularly by British Empire troops in the desert campaigns in Libya and Egypt. And the last army to be officially issued heliographs was the Canadian Army. And apparently the soldiers were sad to see them go because they made great shaving mirrors. And although they were never issued again, heliographs remained in the official stores of both the British and the Australian armies well into the 1960s. And as late as the 1980s, the Afghan Mujahideen, in their fight against the Soviets, used heliographs to communicate from mountaintop to mountaintop. And so a very successful and long-lived piece of kit, despite how simple it is. Though you can see some of the advantages. This is lightweight and easy to carry, it's robust, and it doesn't require any batteries or other external power source. Though this is somewhat offset by the fact that you can only use this in clear weather during the day, though these tended to be issued in areas of the world where that wasn't much of an issue. Right, so let's have a closer look at the Mance heliograph and see exactly how it works. So this is really very simple. This is just a tripod with a rotating platform and a parabolic mirror mounted on a pair of trunnions to allow it to tilt back and forth. The thing about the British heliographs in particular is that they projected a very narrow beam. It only spread out at about half a degree. Now, on the one hand, this is great for signal security, since your enemy has to be very close to the line of sight to intercept your messages. On the other hand, it means that you need to align these very carefully in order for your recipient to properly get the message. 
And how you would do this is you would place yourself in front of the mirror and you would align it until both your recipient station and your face were right in the middle of the mirror. Then you would hold still and unfold this sighting vein, which here has either crosshairs or a little blade with some alignment marks. And you would adjust this side to side until it was also perfectly aligned with the center of the mirror. This meant that you were now aligned with your target station. Then what you would do is go in behind the heliograph and using this adjustment screw here, adjust the angle of the mirror until the shadow cast by this little unsilvered spot in the middle of the mirror fell onto the shadow vein. And what this did was make sure that the mirror would only reflect sunlight towards your recipient station when you depress the key. This is important because if you had stray flashes, it could garble your message. And then once all that was set up, then you're ready to send your message. And all you would do is tap on this adjustment screw here, like a telegraph key, to send flashes of light and Morse code messages. But now you're probably wondering, well, what happens if the sun is behind you? That is, you are between the sun and your recipient. Well, there is a solution to that. And that's this, a secondary mirror that comes with the heliograph that can be mounted where the shadow vein normally is and which can reflect the sun behind you into your primary mirror. And as you can see, the center of the secondary mirror has the same alignment marks as the shadow vein. Now, although the beam produced by this mirror is very narrow, there are situations in which you want it to be even narrower. For example, during the Boer War, when both the British and the Boers were using heliographs in close proximity to one another. And so in that case, what they did was mount a short piece of tube in front of the heliograph mirror in order to narrow the beam and reduce the risk of interception. Conversely, there are situations in which you want the beam to be wider. So for example, if you are signaling to a ship out at sea, uh, if the ship is moving very quickly or if it's bobbing up and down on the waves, your recipient might intermittently lose sight of your signal. So in those cases, a dispersion lens was provided that clipped in the same spot and which increased the angle of the beam from 0.5 degrees to 15 degrees. Now, under ideal atmospheric and solar conditions, the maximum operating range of one of these was around 120 to 160 kilometers though the world record for heliograph communications is a whopping 295 kilometers. This was set on September 17th, 1894, by U.S. Signal Corps Captain W.A. Glassford when he and his signal sergeant sent a message between Mount Ellen, Utah, and Mount Uncompagre, Colorado. Now, although the man-style telegraph remained the de facto British standard for the period where heliographs were in common use, one complaint that was made was that tilting the mirror up and down tended to gradually throw it out of alignment. And one potential solution to this was the Begbie heliograph, which included not one, but three tripods, two with mirrors and one with a slotted screen. And what you would do is you would arrange these tripods so that mirror number one would reflect sunlight into mirror number two and then through the screen. And by tapping the telegraph key, you would turn the screen side to side to interrupt the light beam. And this arrangement meant that you only had to adjust mirror number one to track the sun. So you could leave mirror number two alone and perfectly aligned with your recipient. But of course, this was a lot more complicated and a lot heavier than the Mance Telegraph. And so it never quite replaced it in significant numbers. Now, American heliographs were a little bit different in that they didn't use a tilting mirror. Rather, they used a spring-loaded screen of shutters, very much like powered signal lamps. They also preferred square or rectangular mirrors because you had more surface area for the same weight. And some of the more common models used by the United States included the Grugan, the Garner, the Purcell, and the 1888 U.S. Signal Service heliograph. So while heliographs are no longer used for regular field communications, they are still issued by most militaries in the form of the survival heliograph. And these are typically packed in survival kits, and they allow you to send signals to rescue aircraft. And this can be made out of various materials, plastic, polished metal, or in this case, glass. And most of them incorporate a little hole in the middle to allow you to more accurately aim the beam. This one is a little bit special, though, because it includes a more sophisticated sighting device. So this is based off a patent by one R.S. Hunter filed in 1951, and it consists of a small section of screen coated in retroreflective material, originally scotch light. 
And what happens is as the sun refracts through the little beads of retroreflective material, it creates a virtual image of the sun, normally referred to as a fireball, that can be used to more accurately aim the beam. And so that is a short history of the heliograph. Thank you so much for watching. A huge shout out to the Royal Canadian Artillery Museum for allowing me to film in their galleries and to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. I'll see you next time on another video where we'll look at yet more communications apparatus and other fascinating devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.